Thank you, sir. All right, you hear, hear me pretty good? Uh, like I was saying, I want to thank the elders for giving me an opportunity to speak with you tonight. Don't do it very often, and, you know, it's uh, going to be some big shoes to fill tonight, but I'll do my best. So, uh, and, uh, and uh, I hope and pray that we'll all learn something tonight. Uh, <clears throat> before we get started, I'd like to ask uh, John Powell if he would lead us in a word of prayer. This evening, I want to talk to you about uh, what man thinks versus what the Word says. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of a lot of things out there that that man says that really don't that uh, are contrary to what the Word tells us. In Matthew chapter seven, verse twenty-one. Uh, it says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. So good people of all churches are saved. That's what man says. But the word doesn't tell us that, does it? Jesus, when saying this, he laid down the principle of a, a negative way of entering his kingdom. I say negative because... Uh, you know, we can't, uh, we can't bake enough cakes to get into heaven. You know, we can't send out enough cars. It doesn't matter how much money you have, uh, how popular you are, things like that. The sense of this verse seems to be, to me, no person by merely acknowledging my authority, believing in the divinity of my nature, professing faith in the perfection of my righteousness, and the infinite merit of my atonement shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. So we see by by this verse is that uh, we have to really do we have to do the will of the Father. We just can't uh, say to get, offer up prayers and things like like that. Just can't say Lord, Lord. Uh, you know, we just can't say it all the time. We gotta we gotta really believe and do the will of the Father. Uh, no mere profession of piety or worship will do. The will of God must be done by all who receive, receive the reward of heaven. So it's not a popularity contest. We, we, uh, it, like I said earlier, it's not the amount of money that we have and things of that sort. It's doing the will of the Father. Not simply just saying that we love God. You know, we've got to do the do the will of the Father. And also in Hebrews verse 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 8, excuse me. For he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And verse uh, 9, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. For he was a son, he claimed no special privileges on that account. He learned both duty and and necessity of obedience and thus leaving the example for us, for us to follow. And through his suffering, he was made a perfect savior, making himself qualified to become the redeemer of all mankind. We learn through our suffering, don't we? We've all suffered and gone through hard times. When you were, when you were a kid, you ever, you ever got a whooping? Let me explain a, a difference between a whooping and a whipping. You know, whipping's when you get the little switch, you know. And uh, your mama or daddy would get the switch and get out. Now, whooping, that's when they pull out the big stuff. <laughs> uh, big artillery. But uh, I've had both of them. Now, 
I'll, I'll clarify something in just a minute. Uh, we, we suffer the consequences of our wrongdoing. Now that's not to say that Jesus was doing wrong. It depends on whose eyes you're looking through. You know, the Jews thought he was a blasphemer because he, he said he was the son of God, made himself equal with God. So to them, that was a crime. So uh, in, that, in that sense, we learn from uh, our mistakes, though Jesus had no mistakes. So uh, Jesus making himself equal with God, to the Jews, that was punishable by death. So uh, not all... Not all people from all churches are going to be saved. But you know, there are good people in all churches, you know. I, I have a lot of friends that are in other churches, denominational churches. Um, you know, they do good. They're, they're morally, uh, they uphold the law. They, you know, they don't, they don't do evil things. And, uh, but you know, like Matthew seven twenty one tells us, not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And that's just a fact. That's not Mike saying that. It's just, you know, it's in black and white. But there are people in every, every there are good people in all churches, but not everybody's going to go to heaven. Acts 2, 47 says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. I hear the writers talking about the Lord's church, not about the denominational churches that come along, came along later. And there are literally hundreds of them. I mean, you could start writing down all the different churches that are out there, and you know, we come up with, I'm sure, hundreds of them. But they're out there. I mentioned to Eddie one day, I said, you know, it's amazing to me how a group of people can take the Bible and uh, twist it around Add, to, add some things to it, take some things away from it, and come up with something that's so unrecognizable that it just baffles the mind. It's just amazing to me how, how, people, how, how groups can do that. Twist it around to suit their own, uh, their own situations. So here the Lord is, uh, adds to his church those who gladly receive the word. I know you've, you've, you've uh, heard the term join. You know, somebody tell you, well, I, I joined a church. Uh, we, we don't do that. You know, we don't join the church of Christ. We're, we're added. We're baptized and we're added to his number. I remember the time when uh, I was added to the church. I remember the month. I don't remember the date. But it was uh, December of 1984. But before that time, I had a friend, and uh, he and I would, I'd go to church with him. It was a Baptist church, and we would go. And I, I, I was attending there, for, I don't know how long, several months. Then I quit going when I met Sherry. So, uh, you know, thank, thank God for her. But when I started going to church with Sherry, I remember I ran into one of the members of the Baptist church at the store one day. And she said, oh, we haven't seen you in a while. Where you been? And I said, I started going to church at the Church of Christ. And she said, well, at least you're going somewhere. <laughs> uh, I, I don't remember what my response was at the time. It's been so long ago. But the people allow themselves to be led around by the hand, uh, never realizing that they're in error. It's amazing, isn't it? Next point I want to talk about is uh, one church is as good as another. Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19 says, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee, unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Here the name Peter means a stone. Uh, it's in the Greek masculine gender. So Peter is a rock. 
which means firm, immovable, fixed as to preaching the gospel in the clearest terms. Now, if I said to you, I'm going to build my church, now whose church am I talking about? Not about my church, right? So what is Christ saying here? Upon this rock, I'll build my church. So the church of Christ. That just goes to reason. I mean, that's just simple stuff. It can't be, it can't be very hard. So uh, no one church, uh, no one church is not as good as another. In fact, there's only one that's mentioned by Jesus, and only one church teaches the true word, the church of Christ. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto you, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Even though Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world, there will be a day of judgment. And many will be cast into hell simply for being in error. And I don't want to be there. I don't want to be part of that. And I know you don't either. There are some who are aware of their errors, and then there are some that are not. But the fact remains that Jesus died for all of us. And being a member of his church gives us the assurance that through our full devotion to God and his word, we'll be judged faithful in the end, and we can enter into his kingdom. Some churches believe you're saved at birth. Some believe that you're predestinated. Can you believe that? But you don't have to be baptized, which we'll get to that in a minute. So if that's the case, and Christ died in vain, didn't he? There's no need to be baptized. If you're already predestinated, you know where you're going beforehand, what's the use of being baptized? You know, it just doesn't make any sense, does it? I want to be with the right church. That's the Lord's church. Then Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, it says that he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So Jesus is the head of all things. Not merely it's ruler. He's not a ruler. He's the head of the body, the church. Christ is the head of the church. Just like the husband is the head of the, of the household. Christ is the head. Not some committee based far away in another country. You know, and they get together and we do what they say. Not a council that meets once a year and they determine what, we're, what the churches are going to do uh, that, the, the following year. Nothing, nothing like that. Nothing, nothing even close to those examples. Christ is the head of the church. We're members of his body and we honor his great sacrifice on the cross each and every first day of the week. You know, that's not always observed in other churches in the denominational world. Now, they may take the Lord's Supper once a year, once a quarter, once a month, you know. That's not what the Bible tells us. So those are some of the things that man says and thinks versus what the Word says. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, tells us there is one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. So there's that key word there, one, one. One body, Christ. Christ is the head of the church. One spirit. That's the same spirit that's bestowed upon the Jews and the Gentile and upon all saints that obey, who obey. So one body, one spirit, and one hope. For it doesn't matter where you, from where you come, what your financial background is or you know, who, your, who your family is and things of that sort. We've all got that one thing in common. We want to live forever. I want to live forever. Not here. Uh, I want that uh, home in heaven. But no matter where you came from, what the case may be, we're all filled with one hope, that of immortality. We all want everlasting life. All want to go to heaven. Being in the church, being a member of his body assures us that we can have that heavenly home that we all desire. 
So being a member of the right church is uh, it's imperative, isn't it, to your salvation. The next thing I want to talk about is bab- baptism is unnecessary. We all know that baptism is absolutely necessary to be added to the church. We know sprinkling the head won't do. You know, dipping your foot in there won't do. Uh, so, you know, we have to be fully submerged. The word repent means a change of mind. So like in Acts 2.38, where Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remissions of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So the word repent means change of mind. Uh, you're turning away. So when someone repents, they're turning away or changing their minds and entering into a state of mind of full devotion to God. You know, they throw away the old part, turn to the, turn to the word. Then their sins are washed away in the watery grave where full submersion is required. And we all know that. You know, I'm, I guess I'm, so to speak, preaching to the choir. But you know, there might be a time when you run into somebody out there that, that might say to you, baptism is unnecessary. And we want to be ready to give an answer to hope that lies in us, right? When you, when you hear the word or think of the word grave, comes to my mind that someone has passed away and they're buried. So we apply the same reasoning here. We're buried in the water and fully submerged. You know, you wouldn't, if you buried somebody, you wouldn't leave them, you know, half, half in the ground, half out of the ground. I mean, that'd be, that'd be crazy, wouldn't it? We're, we're buried in the, in the water, fully submerged, and then after that, we arise a new creature out of the water all things are all things are washed away and we arise a new creature baptism is absolutely required and we know sprinkling doesn't submerge or bury the obedient and besides babies are born without sin we know that people out there tell you something different yeah the baby's Babies have sin because they were, they were born of sin. Well, I've a, I'm sure you feel like I do. It's hard to, hard to wrap my, my brain around that, you know? you know. How can an innocent baby uh, be guilty of sin? It just doesn't make any sense. They're not of an accountable age. Then in Acts 22, 16, tells us, And now, why tarriest thou, arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, we're all familiar with the story when Paul, on his way to Damascus, uh, you know, he saw the light, Jesus spoke to him. And then after, after that event, Paul couldn't see. He didn't have any sight. So he had to be led by the hand into Damascus. And then Ananias told him what he needed to do. He told him to arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. But being baptized was commanded by God of Paul. Wouldn't we be subjected to the same requirement which we have been and we've, uh, and we've obeyed? And then in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, the like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us, not putting away the filth of the flesh, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So baptism saves us from sin. The water in of itself, you know, cleanses the body. You know, we can take a shower and we're clean. Uh, I remember when I was younger, uh, I don't know how commonplace showers were at the time, but when I was growing up, we didn't have one. And somebody told me, you know, we just took baths. Somebody told me that, you know, you're not supposed to 
dip your whole body in the water and, and get submerged because, uh, you know, that's not right. You're not supposed to do that. And I thought to myself, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. But well, we shower, we get clean, take a bath. But simply taking a shower doesn't cleanse the soul from sin. Like I said earlier, when we repent, we turn away from sin and submit to God the Father. So therefore, in order to, to be cleansed, we must have the right frame of mind towards God. So there's that uh, good conscience toward God. So we need to be baptized. In Romans 6, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verses 3 through 6, Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So I, in, the, in this passage, I think the, the key word uh, is buried. You know, we've got to be baptized. You've got to be buried with Christ. Like I said, sprinkling would not do. Christ died on the cross and was buried, then rose on the third day. So in comparison, we're buried in a watery grave and we arise all clean and new. When a person is baptized, they're, they're both buried and risen and the sinful body is destroyed that we would no longer live in sin nor serve sin. And then in Colossians 2, Verse 12 tells us, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Again, buried being the key word here. Without the burial, there can be no redoing of the body. No cleansing of the body. No cleansing of the soul. No forgiveness of sins. So, as you can see, we've got to be Baptized. Can't have one without the other. No baptism, no rising a new creature. They, they work together. If you're not baptized, you can't rise a new creature. You can't arise a new creature. See how that works together? And then you probably heard somebody say this in the past. Now, personally, I've never heard anybody say it, and I've never uh, heard of somebody saying this. But someone might say, I feel like I'm saved. You know, can you imagine somebody saying that? Well, I just got this feeling that I'm saved. That's dangerous, isn't it? But I'm pretty sure someone has said this in the past. One soul is nothing to fool around with. And uh, simply going on a feeling, <clears throat> excuse me, simply going on a feeling is dangerous. If you're like me, you want honest to goodness proof that you're saved. You know, I suppose it's just human nature to have a, a feeling. You know what I'm saying? You have a feeling what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, have an intuition about something. I know women are famous for that. <clears throat> you know, women's, <clears throat> women's intuition. <clears throat> Excuse me. Someone said, well, I had a feeling about that. Or, <clears throat> excuse me, I had a, I suspected something like that was going to happen. You know, he just had a feeling. But you know, we can't apply that to your soul. Well, I just got a feeling I'm saved. You know, you just can't, people just can't, don't need to do that. I just can't imagine someone going through life every day with that sort of disposition. Very dangerous. In Proverbs 14, 12, it says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So there, there are ways that seem right to us, uh, right to a person, but it leads to destruction. So we can't go on a, just a, a feeling of being saved. 
excuse me. And then in uh, Acts 23, verse 1, uh, Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. So Paul, standing before the Sanhedrin, he probably knew a lot of the people there in the, in the assembly. You know, they had him out there before he became Paul, uh, rounding up Christians and persecuting them. And now, look, look, at the, look at the situation that he's in now. He's one of them that he persecuted. You know, that's, think about that irony. Uh, Paul knew he was in the right. He knew before that assembly that he just didn't have a, <clears throat> he didn't have a feeling that he was saved. He knew for a fact that he was saved. He knew, he knew that for a fact. And having that kind of assurance allows us to serve God with a clear conscience, having no doubt about one's salvation. <clears throat> and then the last one, the Lord's Supper annually. <clears throat> we know that's not right. <clears throat> Acts 2 verse, Acts chapter 2 verse 42, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of prayer and in prayers, or breaking of bread and in prayers. Like I said a, a few moments ago, not all churches take the Lord's Supper like we do. You know, they may take it once a year. I mean, they call it communion. Uh, may take it once a year, once a quarter, once a month. But we do it every first day of the week. And you know why? That's right, because we're, that's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're commanded to do. We're to take the Lord's Supper <clears throat> every week and go back to that day when Jesus died on the cross. Obviously, we weren't there the day he died. But when we take the Lord's Supper, we can go back and we can discern the Lord's body. And we can imagine what, what it must have been like. And think, think about that time. We honor him for that. To me, just taking the Lord's Supper once a year or any other time other than once a week would be a, would be dishonor to the Lord. Acts 20, verse 7 it says, and upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. So we know as Christians when to take the Lord's Supper, how to take the Lord's Supper, and what attitude we're, we're to have. <clears throat> and... Uh, if we take it with the wrong state of mind, we could uh, eat and drink unto ourselves damnation, and nobody wants that, do they? So we got to have our minds right. But like I said, when we take the Lord's Supper, our minds should go back to that day and picture in our minds the pain and suffering our Lord and Savior endured for all of mankind. Well, I thought that was the last one, but it's not. Fooled you, didn't I? I think this is the last one. Can't fall from grace. How many people have heard, how many of you have heard that? In James chapter five, verses nineteen and twenty, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. So that this verse explains to us that we can fall from grace. It's true. But when we're brought back to the fold, multitudes of sin can be hidden and save a soul from death. This tells us two things. One can err and fall from favor with God and that the erring Christian can indeed be brought back to the fold. You think about it, the devil works on us every day, doesn't he? I remember before I became a Christian, when I was younger, uh, I, I did things that, you know, like most young, young people did. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not innocent of those things. I'm ashamed of them, actually. But uh, 
once I became a Christian, I know God doesn't remember those anymore. But the devil, <clears throat> it's like he's in your back pocket, isn't he? Every day, every minute of the day, you know, he's working on you. But before you became a Christian, it seemed like he didn't bother with you that much because you, <laughs> you already belonged to the world. So he didn't really bother with you. But now that you belong to, to Christ, you know, he's on you all the time. Sometimes he's successful. Most of the time he's not. But it's, it's good to know that if we do err, that there's a way back. And then in Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, it tells us that Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Now you need to know uh, that he, he's talking to uh, those that were holding on to the old law, the Mosaic law. So he was saying to them that you think you're, you, you go, you're going by the old law, you think you're justified. But yet you're falling from grace. In fact, they were never in grace once Jesus came. They were in error and thus falling from grace. And there are people today living traditions of living by traditions of men instead of seeking out the truth. I go to this church or I go to that church because, well, my parents go there. Or I was raised in that church. Or I hold a leadership position in that church you know it's like they're stuck more my whole family goes there these people haven't fallen from grace they're just living in error and then in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 27 but I keep unto, keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So Paul here is talking about keeping his body in subjection to Christ. So Paul being a human, we're human, we make mistakes. You know, Paul was admitting to us that, man, it's tough. I have to do this constantly. Keep my body in subjection to Christ. You know, our minds run away from us. They, all kind of things pop into your mind, you know. Uh, our focus is to be on God and his will. You know, a, a bad thought might run into your mind and then you run it out thinking of something else. Good. Think of some good things, you know. Run that thought on out. That's the devil working on you. You know, he's, he's never going to leave you alone. That can be a daunting task sometimes. But it can be done. It just takes devotion and uh, constant study. That's why it's important to come to church. Uh, you think of the—I think of the church as a training center. You know, I'm encouraged by all of you when I come here, and uh, you know, I feel the—I feel the love that we have for one another, and uh, I feel good that I'm doing what what the Lord has told me to do. And you're doing the same thing. But you can't learn if you don't come to church. You can't learn if you don't study. You know, it's sad too, and and I'm not being judgmental here either, but it's the truth. Uh, Many of our own will not be rewarded. So we, you know, salvation is something that you do yourself. I can't save any member of my family. That's something they have to do on their own. Paul also, he's also expressing the importance of saving others, of bringing bringing others into the fold of Christ. Can, Can you agree 
that when we spread God's word, we're working out our own salvation. Our purpose on earth is not to be popular. Though a lot of people get, you know, they, they get all bogged down with being popular uh, with other people. That's not our purpose on earth. You know, we're not to be, our purpose on earth is not to be rich, be a millionaire. You know, money's fine, you know. Uh, it's just that love of money that uh, leads to the destruction of many people. And our purpose here is not to be friends with the world, but to glorify God and obey his commandments. We're put here to glorify God. That's it. That is it. You know, a lot of people, the nominational world gets that backwards. And then in John chapter 12, verse 48, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Well, it's a fact. We're all going to be judged. <clears throat> going to be judged by the word spoken by Christ. So wouldn't it be better to accept his word than to reject his word and be judged by those words? Well, that's it. I've come to the end. Are there any questions or comments? Good comments would be appreciated. Uh, again, I want to thank the elders for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. I haven't spoke with, spoken to you in a while. Uh, I jump on every opportunity that I, that I have. You know, practice makes perfect, they say. So, well, there's nothing else, then uh, that's it. Thank you.